got Ryan Gazder making his first video appearance in EPS, our moderator from Dubai. Welcome. Hey, Stefan. Thanks for having me. And hi, everyone who is watching or who will watch this tomorrow or sometime in the future. It's, He's, uh, uh, we're, we're past Ryan's bedtime. It's, it's uh, going to be approaching midnight as, as, we, as we head through this discussion. And my first question when I saw his backdrop is, is wow, you had a really cool quarantine, uh, quarantine project on your wall. So, so tell us what we're seeing behind you. So this is actually a wooden map made in Ukraine. I saw a post somewhere on somebody's Instagram. I think it was Anna on EPS. Anna, thanks, by the way, for it was a great idea. So she told me there was this company in Ukraine that makes these custom wooden maps. And I thought, hey, that's like a really great project because you get it in these little jigsaw pieces and you assemble it and then you stick it on the wall. Uh, it, the map also comes with, of course, I know the names of the oceans, but it also comes with these uh, with, with these little airplanes. And I've, I've actually put them in the direction of places I haven't been to or I really want to get to. So oh, this, wow. this one is, I mean, I've been to Brazil, but the rest of I'll, South I'll America. You, um, uh, oops, sorry, I'll put you on the, the full screen. Oh yeah, so we can really see the yeah. sweep of it. <laughs> yeah. So there are a couple of these airplanes and there are a couple of boats. I don't know if you can see the boats, but yeah, there's, there's a boat over there because I'm going to do some epic uh, sea voyages as well. Uh, there's one over here because I, I want to go to... Uh, Chegos, which is uh, Diego Garcia. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm, I'm just, I've just stuck those uh, boats and airplanes where someday I hope I will head to. All right, well, talk about epic sea voyages. You said Chegos, what are the other epic sea voyages you're planning and how do you intend to accomplish those? Right, so, uh, you know, I came across this term called rock hunter. Uh, uh, I have been fascinated by these remote islands. I'm, I, I know that they're really expensive to get to, and for a lot of people, it, it seems like a very pointless voyage, but I can assure you for a lot of people, it isn't. It's uh, these these rocks uh, in the middle of nowhere, they really fascinate me and they captivate me. Uh, so the next achievable uh, rock hop that I wanna do is uh, is the Diomede Islands. So separated by the international date line exactly between uh, Alaska and uh, Chukotka. The two little islands, the little Diomede is American, the big Diomede is Russian. And there's like around uh, two and a half miles or four kilometers of uh, Arctic Ocean in between them. I always wanted to walk across it, but uh, the, the sea just doesn't freeze at that latitude anymore because of global warming. So I hope I can canoe across it. Or, so, that, that's, so that's something that's very achievable. A shout out to uh, Babis Bizas who gave me a contact for someone who's, uh, who's arranging the boat and everything. Um, yeah, and I've been since since you brought those to my attention, I've I've been uh, reading a bit about the the interesting history. I mean, it's it's incredible, and uh, as, as you say, there's there's part in the U.S., part in Russia, and uh, uh, just fascinating. Uh, there's a recent book published on that, and some articles. I I I don't know that I'll be able to join this trip, but I'll virtually follow along with you and, and look to do that myself, as as well as Kamchatka and and so many areas and in that region um, is, so you said it's a Ukrainian company. Is there anything particular about that map that's that's different? Like, did they make Ukraine double the normal size or, or something? <laughs> well, I'll tell you something quirky about this map, all right? Uh, yeah. So, of course, the Crimea belongs to Ukraine. Even India yeah. has the, the Indian map that you see in India, which is like the whole of Kashmir. I mean, it, you won't be able uh -huh. to see the outlines from here, but mm -hmm. all of Kashmir is in India. All of yeah. the northeast of India is in India. So th there's a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, tricky political boundaries that they've just ignored altogether. And they're producing <laughs> a map that they believe people who are suffering from a similar situation as the Ukrainians are probably suffering from now. So they wow. put every country uh, in with, with those original borders that each country thinks belong to them. I, that was too convoluted, I know. But if you're a fan of geography and history and geopolitical stuff, you'll understand. I'm fascinated with that, and I remember when I, f I first started studying in China a couple of decades ago, it was, looking at the map, it was like every every one of China's neighbors, there was some kind of dotted line um, on each map yeah. because they, yeah. they hadn't at the time settled all of the, the, the claims, and sometimes it was a bigger deal, sometimes it was like a bridge or a, a little sandbar that they, they were disputing. You also told me that, that your wife helped you put that up on the wall, and I, I don't know how many of us have spouses that that would willingly 
help us <laughs> indulge our hobby on our on our wall, our living room wall like this, and and even help along. I, I certainly would never get approval for that. So tell us about your your it must be a wonderful relationship. <laughs> Well, now, now that you asked, I, I have to tell you the story of how we met. So uh, we met on a New Year trip. I went to Taiwan with a bunch of friends and I met her at the airport. And uh, uh, we met around a baggage belt. We've been together since that very day. Now, uh, five months after that, we got married. And wow. uh, ever since we got married, uh, no, we, both, we, were, we both lived in different countries. We met in Taiwan. Uh, we made it work for five months. We got married and ever since we've we got married. We've been. She moved to Dubai, and we've been to around. Uh, it's been a year. It's been almost two years. We've been to around thirty-two countries together. Wow. So yeah, she's uh, hopped aboard. Uh, we share the same passion for a lot of things, and uh, seeing the world together is one way that we will, you know, get to know each other. Fantastic, and that's uh, certainly a great way to intensely get to know someone. I've I've occasionally met couples that are. Are uh, like we're, we're we're just getting together and we're going to take a year travel together. I'm always wondering what you know if, if the relationship will be great if it can if it can go through that and and just the stresses of travel. So everybody's asking about the the map distinction. So Nagorno Karabakh, the Caucasus, Taiwan, how are they all uh, represented on your map? We, we could spend all day on <laughs> looking through the, the map on your yeah. wall. I, I haven't actually looked for Nagorno Karabakh myself, mm. but uh, now that now that you're talking about it. It's it's there. It's there. It's a little sliver of the Gorna Okay. But uh, there we go. So, the, so the, the difficulty is not about having a spouse that mm -hmm. wants to travel with you. It's about mm -hmm. finding the time to travel because you know we are working mm -hmm. full time, both of us. Uh, mm -hmm. The travel we do is not like the travel I see a lot of people in EPS doing. Like who mm -hmm. we can't afford to do a deep dive. Uh, you know, spend more than a week in a country is like something I can't even think about today. So we do the best we can. Luckily, we live in Dubai and Dubai is a very, very well connected, you know, city. So many countries within like a four hour, six hour, eight hour radius. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is a little bit of a shallow dive, seeing if mm -hmm. we like a place, if we can keep going back or, you know, if some Ethiopia, for example, a great country to be in transit for a couple of days, explore a new part of the country and then, you know, do something else in Africa. So that's the kind of style of travel we, we, we do while working full time. We had a few places planned this summer, but you know, there's the virus all over the world. So, uh, so, th so then this, this sort of thing becomes like a weekend project. We did this exactly two weekends ago. And wow. uh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So it comes I keep in the colors. So they're, it's a very nice company. Uh, please check them out. It's called enjoythewood.com. Enjoytheworld.com or wood Enjoy or the world? Wood. The wood. Enjoy Enjoythewood.com. The wood. Oh, yeah. fantastic name. It's a very like naughty that. name. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing so many uh, comments. I think we should have had your wife on the podcast too. Maybe she'll be able to drop by and say hi if she's not already asleep. But I, I didn't know you were a traveling couple. So that, that shows I've, I've not had the pleasure to meet Ryan. He, he popped in the my EPS life and volunteered to help. And I said, that's that's fantastic. And you happen to also be in a wonderful time zone to uh, to uh, help uh, all those. I, I used to get all those messages of, you know, why haven't you approved my post? And I, I try to say I'm in Seattle and I was I was asleep. So please, please be patient. But let's Let's do some gentle ribbing, though. I, uh, I, I never tell people who who declined their post, but the the secret I think is if it if the post was declined, it's almost always you. Uh, so you're the you're the bad cop. So <laughs> now now it's yeah, exposed. I, so, so by, by default, I, I declined. <laughs> I, I declined more than eighty percent of posts that I see in the stream. So uh, the the heat's off you, Stefan. So don't don't post during. What are the hours you're most active on Facebook then? <laughs> well, let's see. So my time zone is like is exactly. Uh, I I'm GMT plus four. So I guess uh, from eight a.m. my time to eight p.m. my time. All right. So that that's the secret is do not post during that time because Ryan might drop the hammer on you. <laughs> but uh, what what makes a good what makes a good post that'll get through? Because I do, uh, you know, we, we we all try to okay find that so, right balance of of what everybody wants yeah. to have 
their question answered or their post, but then it is a flood that doesn't work for anyone. So we have to make decisions and, and you're you're much better at me at being rigorous to the, I think the rules and the ethos of what we're trying to do. Well, I, I would really like it if, uh, you know, anyone who has a question can make the post more readable. Uh, and all you need to do is, you know, have a title on top rather than just mm -hmm. having a bunch of text in the body and then everyone will have to read it. Uh, you know, for many people, it may not even be relevant. So if if you want to know how to get a train in Azerbaijan, just write, I need a train in Azerbaijan, capitals on top. And then you put whatever it is you want in the body. It, it just mm -hmm. makes it so much more easier for someone to pick out the relevance, who's in that part of the world or who's just done that recently. That would be helpful. Uh, please don't post photo albums, like 20 photos or 40 photos. Most of your photos are great. Most of your photos are amazing. There are places I've want to go to i haven't been to i hope i can go to or you know this is not about photo quality this is just about you know uh, keeping the stream relevant it's just if everyone posts photos that there's your private facebook profile there's your instagram page for your own photos you know make a nice post link your instagram there we have that every monday every wednesday that uh, i think that's that's beautifully said and i i think we need to update some of the guidelines you know that that make a title it, it is a it is a great help and i and i feel like one of the uh ways that that i try to think about it is if you're asking a question on facebook it's different than asking a question on google you're i don't mind you know you're asking google servers to do some extra work it's not you know any any big cost to them but when you're posting something to a group of several thousand people it's, it's essentially saying, please spend your time to to look at my question, you know, rather than rather than Mr. and Mrs. Google. And so those, those efforts anybody can make to make it clear so that that also that people that would be in a position to answer or contribute or get in the discussion know that ah, that's an area where I have something to say and I'll dive in. And, and title is a great place to, to start with that. So just to talk about uh, posts not getting approved, the reason I signed up to be a moderator was because my posts weren't getting approved. And I was like, why? You know? So for why the purely selfish what, what, reason- What were you doing wrong or were you doing nothing wrong and it was our fault? Well, it's it's so far away in the past. I'm, I'd, I'd like to think that you guys were just too busy, you know, moderating posts. But uh, I, for, for a purely selfish reason of just getting my question out there and getting my answers, I said, okay, you know what, let me, I haven't abused that privilege much, though. I don't think I've posted much as like a as a top level post. Yeah. That, that's fantastic, and, and your candor is is certainly what we love when we're when we're discussing uh, things internally about how to handle situations. And in another area where I I really enjoy your candor, I, I won't use your phrase to de describe your passport, but uh, people that say have a goal to travel to. A lot of the world, every country in the world, it, uh, you know, there, there's economic uh, differences, there's time differences. As you said, you, you don't have a lot of time available right now. And, and the passport uh, is, is a big difference in terms of visa availability. So talk about how your passport, how you structure your travels to uh, either take advantage in some cases of things not available to others or, or the challenges you encounter. All right. So uh, for for those who don't know me, I'm uh, I'm born in India. I travel on an Indian passport. It's not as uh, it's not as easy to travel when 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 you uh, need a visa for almost every country you go to. Uh, there are a few hacks that I've learned along the way. Uh, my fellow Indians in the group uh, they definitely know most of these hacks because we've probably got together and discussed this sometime or the other. So the the first and the most uh, the, the most obvious thing is I can't just if I have to travel, I can't just uh, decide, all right, it's the weekend. I'm going to pack my, take my backpack and head off to the airport and grab a flight. I can't do that. I have to have like a visa to go to most places. So for, for people like me, uh, travel is not as spontaneous as it is for someone like who's, say, traveling on a Western passport or, say, an Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. Or, or an, so in order to, to not uh, keep specifying, I just say good passport and shit passport. <laughs> I hope no one has a problem with the word, but uh, it's it's just uh, it's just to you know give give you a quick identifier. So traveling is not as spontaneous as we'd like it to be. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I do have a long-term Schengen visa. I do have a US visa. And all of that allows me to get access to a lot of countries which I would normally require a visa for. But then they say, okay, you have a US visa. Okay, you're pre-approved. You're not a dangerous guy. You can come on in. But the fact is I still have to do a few additional leaps and bounds of paperwork that most mm -hmm. Western travelers would take for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's about it. So a lot of my gripes come from the fact that uh, I have to spend several hundreds of dollars or several hundreds of euros to get visas, go for fingerprinting, you know, uh, get a mugshot, and then go through one or two weeks of absolute uncertainty, whereas, you know, anybody else could just walk into the country. So that's just how it is. I'm not, I can't do anything about it. I can just find a way around it. And is it typical that you need to have, say, employment letters, banks, notarized bank statements, these kind of things as well? Yes, each and every time, even though that I would be going to the, the same European embassy for like almost a decade now, every year, same documents, same documents. So uh, it, it's like your employment history, your your bank statements, your like, if, do you own property? Do you like, mm -hmm. what are your other sources of income? And there's like just so much unnecessary paperwork when you can see that a person with a well-established travel history is not really a threat. Uh, mm -hmm. But for some reason, this is, I mean, I guess it's bureaucratic. It's, uh, it's, it's probably, you know, treaties. It's, it's probably also the number of people from a particular country who, who just end up as illegal immigrants in another country. So there's so many factors at play and, you know, I'm just a normal person caught in this big geopolitical situation. Uh, so one of the questions was hardest visa to get and, and perhaps uh, hard, and that could also be hardest visa that you haven't gotten. And, and that's by uh, Andrea or Andrea, who also, uh, uh, well, let, let's say, uh, let's see, the f first post he, he or she made in the uh, in, in the group uh, a year ago was was not a, not approved. So we can we can say we can blame it on me instead of Ryan. <laughs> it was probably me. Come on, Stefan, I'll take the heat off you for today. <laughs> so I mean, the they got to see your face yeah, every day, so they need to like you more. Yeah, the uh, the hardest visa you've gotten, and then the hardest visa you've been denied and, and haven't succeeded at. So I haven't been denied a visa yet, simply because I'm anal and meticulous about it. Simply because of you know of of the way it's been historically. I I just have every document ready. So if I have to go to apply for a visa, I've got like a whole folder of documents. I'm ready to go. So that's like the uh, it, it's it's everyone who who has everyone who travels on a shit passport has and who's a regular frequent traveler and lives for travel will have this folder ready with every document you need like you know your, your how much land does your grandfather own and you know <laughs> uh, did your great grandfather smoke weed and uh, you know everything is there so i haven't been denied a visa yet uh, the hardest visa i had to get which i got was a namibian visa uh, now i've i've been doing uh, so Dubai is is the UAE, the the United Arab Emirates has a lot of mm -hmm. uh, foreign relations and a lot of uh, a lot of embassies. Namibia mm -hmm. wasn't one of those embassies, so oh, by yeah. default I could only get a visa from my home country or the nearest country with a Namibian mission. So the nearest countries with a Namibian mission were like Egypt, but I've been to Egypt, uh, Malaysia, I've been to Malaysia, India. I'm not going to India. So uh, there was a uh, Zimbabwe hadn't been oh. to Zimbabwe. So this is actually a, a, it's not really a hack, but it's something I use to travel many times. Uh, I, I can travel while I'm waiting there in that country while my passport is gone to get a visa stamped. Mm -hmm. I'll, you know, look around that country and, you know, take in whatever I can. So I, I went to Zimbabwe to get a Namibian visa. But of course, over there, they said, oh, but you're not a Namibian resident. So you cannot, I mean, sorry, you're not Zimbabwean resident. You can't yeah. get a visa from here. And so I, I got really frustrated. I wrote, a, I, I went online. I looked for the Namibian Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, and I sent, I sent an email to whichever email addresses I could find on their contact me section. Somebody replied and said, "You, you should not call the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You should write to the Ministry of Internal Affairs, or whatever." Okay. <laughs> so I wrote to the Internal Affairs. Then they said, "No, no, no. This is the wrong." So I, I wasn't, even, I wasn't just writing. I was also calling. Of course, no one ever picks up the phone in these places. So yeah, after this ping pong, I got really frustrated, and uh, I wrote. I found the website of the Prime Minister of Namibia, and I wrote to the Prime Minister. So yeah. I got an email back 
from the prime minister's office saying, we're very sorry you had to go through all this. Uh, we will arrange a special visa for you. You just take a flight. I mean, you, they sent me this letter. They said, mm. you just take this letter with you and you get on a plane. So mm. I've been to Namibia invited by the prime minister. And oh. that was like the hardest visa I ever got. Oh, that's, <laughs> and that's incredible. And I, I, I imagine the, uh, uh, they probably haven't even seen seen a letter like that, and, and the whites of their eyes are just you know their eyes are getting big as they see like who is this guy that's that's showing up and and uh, must they must have uh, did they did they welcome you to the VIP arrivals when when you had that letter or anything? Or... Come again, sorry. Did, did they? I'm just wondering the reaction of people when you're actually entering Namibia. Did they? Did they get yeah, so they had no clue. They, oh, they they looked at a letter. They had never seen a letter like this. They thought I, I they thought I printed a fake letter. And like I said, they, they held me aside. They made a lot of phone calls, uh, and and then of course it 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 got cleared and I was through. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking like uh, Congo Brazzaville when I arrived there and I flew in and the uh, embassy in Washington had stopped requiring a letter of invitation. So they gave me the visa and I had the valid visa. But I didn't have an LOI, and I'm arriving there. It's I think Sunday morning local time, so Sunday afternoon, and it was like two hours of well, you couldn't have a visa without an LOI. And I said, but I have a visa. And they said, but you can't have a visa without an LOI. Call the embassy. I'm like you know, they're not answering Sunday afternoon. I think he just wanted to shake you down for for, for like twenty dollars. That's, that's the thing, and I you know they they never were explicit, and they never uh, and they finally just uh, the supervisor finally appeared. The, the one guy who wasn't dressed in uniform, uh, he appeared, a very soft-spoken gentleman, and and uh, wished wished me to have a good stay. But um, yeah, they they could have been looking for for money, but they they were never they were never hinting like that. I'm hungry, kind of kind of thing. And I and I had a fabulous visit. Uh, Ryan, speaking of your your diplomacy, Ryan as Globetrotter says uh, he complained once about the uh, Congo Brazzaville uh, border, and and your advice to him was. People from Central Asia experience this at every border, not just one. So he appreciates the <laughs> the tough love uh, that that you doled out. And uh, and Ben Sand is saying he he wishes he had an Indian passport because the the questionnaire he goes every year the questionnaire as long as the the Rig Veda and you know your your mother's maiden name who cares? But but I would actually say uh, so. My wife uh, originally is is a passport that that would have a lot of paperwork as well. And we learned a lot about her family history. Because of these these forms like that of saying what what's your grandmother's maiden name and, and all of this and uh, you know, so nobody knows you know you're going back you know asking your parents and then you get the the life story so maybe it's a traveler's way to, yeah. to investigate some of your so the, uh, the other uh, the other not really tragic thing but I mean tragic for people like me is uh, you know you go through a lot of hoops and you put through a lot of documentation you finally get a visa you go to that country you come back and then they announce oh now there is e visa for you from next month <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that happened, that happened, to, me, that that happened to me after I went to Ukraine after I went to Kazakhstan after I went to Kyrgyzstan after I went to Tajikistan I mean after I finished most of the stands what literally a month later e visa e visa e visa mm -hmm. I wanted to tear my hair out <laughs> I felt that way at times, and uh, it was it was more it was more. There was a period when I was living in Beijing, and a period where I was living in New York, where I, in some way, I sort of liked not having e visas for some because visiting these diplomatic missions was was an experience and a, and a trip in itself. At times, it felt. I mean, I, I I would you know didn't like having to pay all those fees and in time, but uh, you know it's it's nostalgic. The, some of the some of the travel challenges we face, and I miss. Not not having seen some of these, uh, I recently learned that I think around May time frame, Washington D.C. every year. I'm, of course, it won't happen this year. That pretty much all of the embassies in Washington D.C. throughout the month on a rolling calendar have open houses, so you could, in a technical sense, visit pretty almost every country in the world on uh, on a technicality sense in that month uh, <laughs> within the Washington D.C. area. Uh, Debjeet also made a reference to OCI, which uh, uh, I'm wondering if you could expand on, and also uh, the Sark Nation. So one area where your passport is powerful is, uh, as I understand, visa-free entry to places like Bhutan that that you don't have to go through the um, the same tour operator. Yeah, restrict. one country. I feel I feel mm -hmm. great. One <laughs> country. Tell me, I mean, so. Uh, 
what I would actually like is if is if uh, let's say people who meet a certain criteria in terms of say travel or income or uh, just just a general like say safe travel history get to apply for like some global uh, visa you, you give all your documents and then for five years you don't have to give any more documents oh talking about talking about visas that that were a pain the saudi arabian visa notoriously painful i i've, I've actually paid one thousand almost a thousand dollars for uh, mm. for a six month visa okay mm. three months after that it slashed it to like some seventy dollars so it's it's not only the documentation that is the pain it's also the, the fact that we we actually have to pay hundreds of and this is like an official fee it is not like a fixer's fee. yeah 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 wow that's i think it's the second most i've ever heard i don't i don't know the current fee but but some years ago uh i was filing a, a chinese uh, passport holder blogger and this is about 15 years ago and belize was charging i think 2500 dollars Plus a several thousand dollar deposit that gets refunded on, on the uh, on your departure, uh, but I, I believe they establish they establish diplomatic relations and then drop the fee a, a few years later. So she, I think she didn't cave to the twenty five hundred. That that would have been a lot. One of the questions is, um, uh, Andrea says, did, did you get an Equatorial Guinea uh, visit in, or is that still? Yeah, pending? I did. I, I did. Uh, so last year, uh, me, uh, my good friend Adam Hickman, my wife Preeti and uh, Alec from EPS, the four of us got together in Cameroon and we made the trip mm -hmm. to Equatorial Guinea. Now it's, I don't know why people think it's a difficult visa, it's not because there are like so many fixers available who will do it from anything from like say 350 to 450 euros. That's like the sweet spot for what it costs. Literally you land in Douala, you get your visa, he takes you to that embassy, you get your visa same day. So it's mm. not as hard as it seems or or I, I don't know why it has this reputation of being a hard visa to get, or maybe it was in the past, but it's it's all changed now. Yeah, I, it, and I guess it depends on just of the the diplomatic missions, say in a place like London, or they post a visa process and people try to follow the process and, and, and get denied, but it sounds like you found the, the right spot to do it. As a, as a US citizen, I benefited from I guess it's the the leader's son loves Michael Jackson and has that mansion in Malibu, so they've yeah. they've had the the visa free arrival uh, section, which which I had no problem even taking the boat in from Gabon as is my entry point. Um, some of the road checkpoints they just weren't weren't as familiar with that, but I never never got hassled beyond just you know why why don't you have a visa and oh, you know we we don't need them. Uh, the uh, oh boy, everybody's talking about all all the all the visa style. All the visa mm. style stuff. So the uh, th th there's a lot of c commiseration. Um, and one of them is just just buy, buy a second passport, which I, <laughs> I I think it wouldn't be as fun if you if you if you had another passport and got got to just scoot into some of these. Um, do you have a plan for when you think you'll you'll reach 193? Is that a goal for you? Is that not a goal? Is there another list you're you're looking at? So I, I don't have a plan because if there, if there was ever a world record, it's been beaten already. So mm -hmm. there, there's no way I'm making a record. I thought I'll be the first. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm vegan. So I thought I'll be the first vegan to do the 193. And then mm -hmm. it turns out there's another guy. His name is also Ryan. Uh, he mm -hmm. goes by the name of Ryan S. Globetrotter on EPS. Mm -hmm. He's also doing the 190. So I, th there's another record uh, that I might not break because he's way ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> You can't even be the first Ryan G then. I, I, I don't know if Globetrotter is a <laughs> name or a gnome de plume, but uh, you can't be the first Ryan G. <laughs> well, uh, now that COVID has kept everyone um, locked locked down for some time, maybe I, I can catch up. Who knows? Uh, speaking of, of, of eating vegan, there, there was a comment, I think it was from Ryan, about uh, a, a Dubai vegan food tour that yeah you had, I, saw, I saw that in the feed yes, i was wondering who that was from yeah what uh vir virtually what uh wh where would you take us if we could join this tour well i have my secret place so whoever uh, uh quite a few eps travelers have uh, met me in the past few months i've always i've taken all of them to the exact same place so if you ever pass by dubai it'll be my pleasure but i'm not telling you where it is over here there's, there's no fun in like Googling it and then zooming in on like Google traffic map and like salivating. No, not gonna happen. <laughs> okay. So talk about dining vegan uh, in your travels. Do you always find options? Do yeah, you... I see Ryan Globetrotter is just uh, 
made a comment. I can't see the name, but I know it's him. US yeah. and Brazil passport. He's going to finish first. Like, no doubt about it, man. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and for, those, and for those, the reason we're saying the name thing is that the way the feed pulls out uh, uh, from the, the closed group, the video feed chat interface just says Facebook user. So I do double time. I watch along on the uh, the Facebook feed and hop back and forth and, and try to alert alert our guests without overwhelming them with uh, mul multiple screens bouncing around. And uh, yeah, they, there's uh, David says, yeah, there's a lot of Ryan on EPS. So uh, <laughs> that's it. So there, there, there's been a few comments related to Sikkim and uh, you know, how much have you traveled around India and, and what are some I of the uh, I haven't traveled much. I think this is the same affliction of everyone. Mm -hmm. we, we've never really traveled our own countries in depth or mm -hmm. as well as we've traveled several other countries. So I'm not very well traveled in India. I've only lived in India for six years of my life when I was an undergrad student. While I was uh -huh. there, I did take a few trains and uh, but Sikkim was all and in those in those years. I'm talking about like around 20 to 25 years ago. Sikkim was mm -hmm. a, a danger zone, a no-go zone. There were like these, uh, say, internal separatists and ultra the opposite of ultra nationalists. Whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. I don't even know the names of these groups, but it it was a difficult thing. Even even Indians needed a special permit to go there. That special permit was stopped. I think less than five years ago is when this uh, restriction was removed for. Indians to travel domestically. So it was a hotbed of militant activity and separatist activity. It's a lot better and more peaceful now, which is a good thing for everyone because tourism is really working in that region. It's very different from most of India. It's, it's you know, the Himalayas and the backdrop. It's, 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 it's just beautiful, peaceful, serene. Uh, I, I, I've not been there. I hope to go there. Not been a Sikkim. I've, I've been to Bhutan. I've been to Nepal. Sikkim, that little thing that sticks out is, mm -hmm. is uh, someday in the future. Yeah, I've been there and really enjoyed it. And it uh, there, there is not an airport. There is a helipad that is at um, Bogdagra that you could fly to, and you can go overland from there or or take the helicopter. I I, I went overland, and it it really is a transition at, at the border post, which was more of a, a roadside shack, I guess would be the way the the Sikkim internal immigration uh, officer, if if that's the right phrase, uh, for entering the the territory uh, was working by candlelight and uh, it just felt it, it felt the mood just shifted and uh, um, uh, really re really slid into it. it it was a rough road up, up that way it's not the most scenic road but once you get up there it's because uh, there's a lot of there was a lot of um, very heavy heavy trucks in that on the road so I, I'm not sure all this betrayal trip stuff I think there's a lot yeah, of insight okay, so that's, that, uh, that I don't know so <laughs> so uh, we, we uh, th there's a group of a few of us in in the UAE. We've been meeting and traveling together quite a lot. So my my dear friend Adam Hickman, I've mentioned him before. Uh, one of my favorite travel partners of all time, Jujana Brenshi. Uh, of course, my wife first and foremost. But I'm just not mentioning her. I'm just talking about EPS people whose names you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, because if my wife sees this tomorrow, I don't want to be on answering what about me so oh, uh, so i should i should send her the link to put on put her on video zuzana and ryan <laughs> yeah so uh and of course debjit debjit is part of this betrayal group so the deal is uh whenever they travel somewhere without uh and 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 i'm not part of it it's called a betrayal trip it's just an in joke amongst like a group of four travelers okay so, well, they keep, great. so every time like say debjit posts something on his instagram i quickly write betrayal or whenever jujana posts some photos I've, she's gone to some country i haven't been to betrayal and then some visa officer somewhere is going to look at your social accounts and say what's what's going on here are you part of some <laughs> some some uh, international Mr. Uh, group and uh so it's speaking of debjit when we talked to him a couple days ago he mentioned ethiopia is a country where there was a special connection or reaction because of his Indian ancestry. I mean, I feel that way from, from Minnesota in the U.S. going to either Sweden or Ethiopia. Uh, I'm sorry, Sweden or Somalia um, because of connections there. Uh, are there places that that your experience you feel has been particularly special or connected in a way that travelers of other nationalities are are, are not even going to even notice that, that that's happening? Wait, I, I I lost that question. It was so long. Okay, sorry. So Deb, we talked about uh, going to Ethiopia. That uh, as I as he related, 
that um, many of the, um, say the hospitals, medical schools, the professors and instructors have been from India. And so he felt a, a much different reaction and welcome to India, uh, to Ethiopia as an Indian citizen, uh, Indian ancestry because so many people, okay. say they, they were taught by an Indian professor and have that connection. Okay, so uh, that's that's pretty easy to answer. Uh, India is a very well known country in general. India has been exporting a lot of culture by way of Bollywood, and these movies have been dubbed in regional languages. So anywhere I've ever been to in the stands, uh, most uh, most notably Uzbekistan, but anywhere in the stands and in Russia, uh, during the times of Soviet Union, I for for some reason as part of some cultural exchange, they would only ever play one Bollywood movie. Every older person, let's say, who's, who's more than like 60 or 70, knows the songs from that movie. Okay. And this is, this is something like our parents' generation would, uh, you know, would have grown up with. So there, there is a lot of, say, cultural uh, comfort. When I went to Uzbekistan, now, this is... Uh, India for like 500 or 600 years of its history was ruled by the Mughal Empire. And when I went to Uzbekistan, I just saw uh, murals and... and uh, buildings and monuments and colors and that 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 immediately like if i didn't know i was in uzbekistan i would think i was in some old indian uh, historical city so th there is so much uh, there's so much of uh, culture that has come to us through other countries or through let's say through history through war and conquest and uh, and everything that has brought with it right uh, there are many places in the world that i've i've been to i've but the and I have felt uh, culturally comfortable simply because people, they're familiar with Bollywood or there's a lot of Indian diaspora. For example, anywhere you look in the Middle East or East Africa, there's there's a lot of Indian diaspora. Uh, you know, people have, the, the food is kind of mixed as well. There's a lot of food, which is, it's not exactly Swahili food in East Africa. It's not exactly Indian food. It's a mix. Even if you go to say Malaysia, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of, let's say, uh, Southern Indian food in and Malaysian food, and they have their own names. So. Uh, the the beauty of this is every time you travel, uh, you know, it's not like your identity is unique. Your identity is actually mixed from several other identities uh, because of, let's say, you know, few centuries or millennia of constant geopolitical evolution. And uh, th that's what also, that's, that's what makes me realize that, sure, we are unique because we were born on a certain patch of dirt, but that doesn't make us special. What makes us special is the fact that we are all you know, intermixed, and we've, you know, we've we're part of this uh, this 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 planet where people have been constantly traveling. You know, through the centuries, uh, you know, settling down. Uh, you know, it's it's. I, I don't even have words to describe the that that epiphany when I got it, but I, I hope you guys can understand. And Devjeet's wondering, do you break into a uh, Bollywood dance? Uh... When you're in the stands to to warm up the babushkas, to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, if if I were good at that, I'd be married like you know oh. maybe ten years before. <laughs> is there is there a, a a Bollywood star that that people say, oh, you look like the star, and maybe you think you don't even look at all like that star, but it keeps coming up. <laughs> Well, I've had a lot of people ask me if I were Mexican or Israeli, or it's it's very rarely that people have mistaken me for an Indian. Okay. And I've traveled. Interesting. And Furkan's asking, have you ever tried to uh, obtain a Pakistan visa or plan a trip there? Well, uh, I want to. I will. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult for me to go back to my own country while I am still an Indian. So it's probably going to be closer to one of my last countries visited, unless there is some special visa thing that happens in the interim. I don't want it to be my last country because it's it's really stunning. I mean, I love the mountains. I, I'd, I'd love to visit Pakistan. And as I understand, that can be a challenge even if uh, you have Indian ancestry, but not uh, not an Indian passport. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So, for example, my good friend Debjit, if he tries to visit Pakistan, he's going to have to he's going to have to prove and submit a lot of documents proving where his dad was from and proving where his dad's dad was from. It, it's so I, I think that Pakistan and Bangladesh both require something like this, especially mm -hmm. for people from India who want to go to these places. Uh, it's unnecessary uh, because you know clearly you can 
you can look at a person and say that you know this guy doesn't want to be an illegal immigrant in your country you can mm -hmm. it's 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 evident from the guy's travel history but i guess this is this is where i come back to you know bureaucracy and old mm -hmm. laws and you know these things are slow to change I remember the uh, the no man's land bus from Amritsar crossing over when I went. There was one other person. It was like a school bus size, and uh, a young woman, I think from the New Delhi area, um, visiting. Uh, I think she was in a design firm, and and somehow there was a way to get a visa to go, and and she just so the process was incredibly long, and and somehow she got got the visa and was able to visit, and um, and I think within within the group, uh, Ranjan Sharma. Was based in the U.S. He might have a U.S. passport now. Uh, great traveler. Uh, he, I think that was his 193 when he finally got the Pakistan visa after after much much time of trying. Um, I, 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 I mean, it's impossible to follow all of the uh, the in jokes and the comments, uh, references to you being taken as a Mexican drug dealer and all that. So I, I, I think I think we should just ignore them for. <laughs> For for a few a, a few minutes and uh, um, uh, just d d depart elsewhere. Um, United Arab Emirates uh, people are familiar with Dubai. Uh, they maybe have some idea that there's deserts or hikes or something, but but as I understand, there's there's a lot of outdoor activities, coastal activities, hiking. Do you do you partake in these? And and for people that want to have a longer stay, maybe up to a week, and, and not just look at shopping malls. What are what are some of the places you recommend? Oh, look, okay. if you have a week, that's that's like one week too long in, in this country, but uh, <laughs> we could do a, a slightly deeper dive. So uh, this is something I was talking to Boris Kester mm -hmm. uh, about. It was, a, it was a trip we're supposed to do uh, when he comes when he comes back next. Uh, there are a couple of these abandoned and haunted villages. It's it's like it looks very similar to say Colmanskop in Namibia, where you've got like the dunes going through like an abandoned uh, set of ruined buildings and mosques. So there's there's something like that. I haven't been to it. I've lived here 17 years. I haven't been there yet. So uh, yeah. that's definitely something we're doing together, Boris. If you're listening, mm -hmm. and uh, Adam, Adam too. Uh, there is a there is a haunted palace belonging to one of the one of the rulers of one of the Emirates. There is a very famous uh, international arms dealer and drug runner. He was arrested in Thailand a few years ago. I, I won't mention names here, but uh, a, a Nicolas Cage movie was made about him called God of War, if okay. you watch that. So, yeah. so his aircraft, the one he used to do a lot of big drug deals to, to Central Africa and to a lot of war-torn countries in Africa, that aircraft is parked permanently in front of a beach resort. That's a place I do take people to if, if they have time to go for a two-hour drive. Um, hiking in the mountains, uh, it's not like hiking in Europe, so don't expect greenery, but it, it has its own stark uh, beauty in its own way. So you're hiking like the, the Northern Emirates, the tip of the Emirates, this tip there, uh, not this, this tip. So uh, you, can see the, you can see the landscape and topology change from your regular rock to pure limestone because the entire area was submerged, say, you know, several millions of years ago. Uh, so I've done some amazing hiking, uh, and uh, hiking season ends around April, Aprilish, because then it starts getting warmer. If it wasn't for COVID, I'd be going for a hike almost every alternate weekend that I'm here. So yeah, sure. If anyone wants to come, yes. Uh, something else that the UAE is really good for is uh, adventure sports and extreme sports. So if you're a paraglider, mm -hmm. if you're a paramotorist, if you're a skydiver, there, there's a lot of cool stuff to do over here with backdrops that can rival anywhere else. Hmm, fantastic. And so you've lived there 17 years. I heard India for six years. Where else have you lived? I grew up in Oman. So when I was 11 months old, my parents uh, put me in a plane and I grew up in Oman. So I spent my first 17 years in Oman, finished oh, okay. high school. Yeah, finished high school, uh, six years in India, undergrad finished, uh, came to Dubai, been here ever since. Started traveling uh, 2015. So I was, uh, I was, I was just sitting down once. I I got this movie uh, mm -hmm. called uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I watched it, and it changed my life completely. Ah. The next week, I was on a plane to Greenland. Ah. okay. Well, Greenland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk about Greenland. That that's a country that I only sp or territory I only spent a few days, and and really wished I had I had done much more. So. 
What, what, what did you do? So uh, I did a couple of things in Greenland. I didn't, so uh, one thing I did is I joined an expedition ship. It was a small sailing vessel with around uh, eight rooms, 16 people and the crew. And uh, we sailed up the Western coast. So we started at Kangaroo Swack, uh, used to be called Sondra Stjomford back in the day. Uh, and we started sailing northwards towards Ilulisa. On the way we got, uh, there was this wall of sea ice. And when I say wall of sea ice, I, li I literally mean like a wall, like, you know, several tens of uh, meters tall. So mm. it was a sailing vessel. It, it wasn't built to go through regular sea ice. It, it definitely couldn't. So our ship was stuck in Maroon. Uh, we had to go through some circuitous route through the inland fjords. Uh, each day that we, you know, each day the ship would weigh anchor, there'd be this thin layer of ice uh, over, over the ocean. Uh, each day we'd actually go on land. Many of these places, uh, I, I didn't really know whether to believe the, the people I was with, but many of these places, they said that no one has really ever stepped foot in places like this. So hmm. it wasn't expedition ships, it wasn't a tourist boat. So everyone there was like an oceanographer, or a marine biologist, or some sort of climate change scientist, or you know, people who were there to do real experiments, measuring like the the recession of the polar ice cap. Or someone there was tagging whales, and so there were different people doing. There was like one of the world's foremost experts on uh, polar bears, and and everyone was introducing themselves. Like when the, when the when the ship started, everyone was you know they did this briefing talk. So like, you know, one guy was saying, I'm Russia's permanent representative to the UN Council on Climate Change. And like, I'm, I'm somebody, I'm doing this double PhD somewhere. Like everyone is introducing themselves like that. And when it was my turn, I just said, hi, I'm Ryan. I'm from Dubai and I'm a tourist. And you decided so, to join like a few days before, right? <laughs> it's just yeah, like yeah, yeah. It, it, I just, I just happened to get a spot on that boat by luck. But that that boat changed my life because everybody there was, you know, was so connected to the environment, to to their to their uh, profession. I mean, I, it's it. I mean, and everyone there had a, a a very very deep sense of passion and regard, and all of them were so accomplished in their own way, but mm -hmm. they had the utmost of respect to this newbie and you know this absolutely unknown like i was literally the most useless guy on that board but every day each one of these people told me okay you take part in my experiment today today we'll measure this today we'll you know we'll run after these uh, sea creatures or you know so i really felt useful but th that was not all so when we finished uh, when you finished that boat experience i uh, i then went and lived on the ice cap for a few days and this involved uh, you know wearing uh, taking these uh, yeah, in 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 closer to the coast, it's it's really really rough ice. Uh, so you have to wear crampons, and you know you have to drag your sled with you across uh, very very uneven terrain. But as you go further inland, and as you go deep inland, the ice literally evens out into this uh, hard one hard sheet. Uh, if it's if it's snowed a, f a few days before, it's it's really dangerous because you don't know where there could be. Uh, a sudden drop or so there, okay. there's a protocol you follow with, with with the guy who's with you like so it was just me and another guy you know, he was a he was a very experienced uh, he, he does a lot of these cross-country things so there, there was you know some strict protocol you follow he has to walk a minimum of six feet away it was, i was doing social distancing five years ago guys so, <laughs> so in case he falls through i like i have the satellite phone and you know so there were we were doing that yeah. so some days i would lead some days he would lead we'd live on the ice cap uh the Sounds cool, but the downside is if you poo, you got to take your poo back with you. Ah. And yeah, did he ever have moments like when you were leading where he was like, are you sure you want to step there? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's incredible. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine. I mean, people, you of course had a background that, that uh, involved a few countries, but it, you know, people in the movies, they, they get inspired to travel and they just go hang out in Paris or Rome for a few days. So you, you pick you pick Greenland of all places and made this happen. That, yeah, that's and, incredible. and you know, strangely, I, I haven't uh, hung out in Paris. I've, I've never seen the Eiffel Tower. I mean, I have been to France. Uh, so I've, I, if I've ever been to Western Europe, it's always been for like business or work related travel. Like, you know, you go meet mm -hmm. some client or some supplier or you go to their factory and so you stay, I mean, it, they've been good experiences because it's not all work. I do try to combine it with the nearest weekend and explore what I can, but it's never been that I've had a business meeting in Paris and I've seen the Eiffel Tower, I haven't. But uh, 
and I, in a way, I was probably saving these experiences for when I'm married. And now that I am, I'm definitely going to see it with my wife. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always said well, these these places are my retirement plan, and then I I accelerated that a little yeah. bit when I was a- able to do so. And uh, yeah, my wife has been asking a lot about Greece. So that was the the plan to to take her to Greece in September, and that's uh, who knows, not not expecting it to happen. So as I guess now that, that that's the through line to Diomed in that is this this expedition that you had to Greenland. Have you have you taken trips since then? And how would you find those kind of trips? Um, so there are websites that uh, that can link you up with uh, expedition cruises. And expedition cruising has actually become a lot more popular and accessible now. So you will find less of the national geographic type of professionals uh, and you'll find more of the adventure tourist type of people. But that's not a bad thing. The, the important thing is that the company that you're going with has a set of professionals who are well versed in that natural environment, who are well experienced as as uh, uh, naturalists, right? I don't know what the exact term is, but they know about the flora, the fauna, the, the mm-hmm. geology, the, the history. And uh, if you have, if you go with a good, so a good expedition tour company that I can recommend, I've gone with them twice, is Ocean Wide Expeditions. Uh, so I did the Greenland thing. I also did with them, uh, uh, I did with them uh, Svalbard. So, mm. so they're, uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure they're pretty touristy, but there are certain uh, times that you can't book any of their boats because it's it's some academic mission or some university thing. Or... And are there other ones that you're targeting that that are maybe not as difficult as as the as your Diomede, but uh, uh, are are really on your radar? So when the Diomede timing... is actually Diomede is actually the easiest of what I'm targeting. The okay. uh, on. There, there are much harder, there are much harder islands like, uh, like uh, Tristan de Cunha or. Uh, well, it's not here, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Chegos. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm obsessed with. I, I want to be actually at Diego Garcia, not, not some sandbar somewhere. So any, any military person I meet, I ask, <laughs> do you have a way? And I've met people who've been there for in their service, but. Uh, yeah, they never, never been able to finagle the invitation. So I'll keep, I'll keep working on that and, in toying with it. Uh, one of the questions: Were you vegan uh, in when you yes, were in yes, Greenland? Yes, I was. I was, uh, I was vegan in Greenland, and uh, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult. Uh, Greenland, I mean, if you're in, a, in a reasonably decent town, there's a supermarket, you can buy stuff. Uh, it's mm-hmm. expensive to buy, like, say, fresh food and fresh produce. Most local Greenlanders, they, you know, they dry a lot of fish and they've got their own thing going. Which, so uh, the other thing, the the other reason why it was easy for me is because for around eight or nine days, I was on that uh, sailing vessel. The sailing mm-hmm. vessel had a cook. All our meals were on board, mm-hmm. and uh, without exception, every one of those marine biologists, oceanographers, climate change scientists, whoever they were, right, they were all vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> So it, it was it wasn't it wasn't as hard as people and I mean back then it, it it might have been hard but today it is not difficult to be vegan anywhere. Okay, that's that's, that's good to know. I, I'm certainly attuned to vegetarian needs. I, I'm not as as expert in in uh, some of the distinctions and, and the challenges. Uh, some other food questions: Ravi's in Dubai or Woodlands in Muscat? Yeah, yeah, I've eaten yeah. both. Uh, I've eaten Woodlands while growing up. Uh, it's it's in it's a very old institution. It's also one of the only places we could afford as kids. So mm. but there were not many places to go to in those days. We're talking about the early 80s. Uh, uh, Ravi's, I haven't eaten that much. I've been there a couple of times. Uh, it's, it's it's a nice place. Yeah, and speaking of Oman, I, I think it's one that it doesn't need to be promoted in, in tourist circles in the sense that I think it's become very mainstream as a great place to visit. I think tourists are probably surprised that it's uh, much geographically bigger than they might assume. So, say you want to see the sea turtles, that's that's a big trip down from Muscat. So, you, you had all those what seventeen years there. What are what are some of the experiences around the country that are are worth the extra drive or potentially flight for somebody on a short time frame? Okay, so uh, there's the the second largest city is called Salala. Actually, now it is Sohar, but back in the day it was Salala when I was growing up. Salala is unique in terms of its topology. It's it's green. They have this uh, 
monsoon kind of rainfall that 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 just lashes the coast and uh, lush green forests for a few months mm. of the year. Um, Salala is also your entry point into Yemen. So if you want to take off another country, you go to Salala. Um, there are, of course, those turtle those turtle nesting spots, Ras al Had, Ras al Junais. So my mom was uh, with the Royal Navy. So we had special access uh, at a lot of naval bases, which, okay. uh, yeah. And these naval bases were on like some of these islands, which civilians couldn't get to. And, you know, we could. Uh, we could actually stay there overnight. They 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 weren't luxurious. The accommodation there wasn't luxurious, but uh, we we got to see a lot of Oman that most civilians wouldn't see. Uh, I don't remember much of when I was a kid, but all of these experiences that that are now mainstream touristy didn't really exist. It's only somebody who was stationed at some military outpost who saw the turtles, and um, it may be some somebody from some university somewhere who you know then collaborate. It, there were no tourists in Oman that I can remember. I mean, there might have been, but not not today, where it's it's a mainstream destination. I and I I, I go to Oman a lot for business, and uh, I do see tourists roaming around. I I never saw that as a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at one point that we you, you hinted at earlier, and I'm I'm thinking about travelers, say with an Indian passport, uh, that are just starting out, and you referenced that having say a Europe Schengen visa or a United States visa can get you access without an additional visa. I'm thinking, say, like some of the Caribbean islands. Could you, for the beginners, the, the new travelers, expand on that a bit? Yeah, so uh, my recommendation is get a U.S. visa first. Put that in your passport first before you go anywhere else, okay? Because that, wherever else you go, wherever else you apply to, they see that, they know that you've qualified, you know, some bare minimum safety and background check. It makes it all the more easier for them to grant you that visa. Uh, mm -hmm. Having a US or a UK or a Schengen multi-entry, multi-entry is important, visa or a long-term, like more than one year Schengen visa, uh, it allows you visa-free access to like easily around 80, 90 or 100 more countries that you wouldn't normally have access to. So mm -hmm. uh, this is not just for Indian passport holders, this is for most, say, uh, Asian, I don't know, I don't, I, most say, most Asian passport holders. So all over the Caribbean. Uh, literally all over South America. Uh, either you get a visa on arrival if you have a U.S. passport or you just have to do a quick electronic visa thing, which you wouldn't otherwise be eligible for. So mm. it does make it a lot easier. Uh, and uh, the, same thing the same thing happens for uh, like places like uh, before Croatia joined the Schengen region. Uh, I, I went to Croatia because I had a Schengen visa, I got access to Croatia, uh, Macedonia. So a lot of the Balkan states, uh, Albania lets an Indian come in. I met my wife in Taiwan because mm -hmm. uh, she had a US visa, she, she could travel to Taiwan. So if she didn't have that US visa and if I didn't have my whatever, I had a US and a Schengen visa at the time, but if we both didn't have these things, we both wouldn't then be able to just hop on a plane and travel to Taiwan. So you see, it, it makes things a lot easier. You can, uh, when we were, when I was, oh, again, uh, when I was, uh, when I wasn't yet married, but my wife and I were dating, we, you know, she would travel here, I would travel there. The only reason, reason she could come here and get a visa on arrival in Dubai was because she had a US multi-entry visa in a passport. So my advice to everyone who doesn't have a particularly strong passport, please get a US visa. Whatever documents it takes, whatever pain you have to go through, just get it, put it in your passport or get a multi-entry Schengen visa, whatever is easier for you. And these, I mean, are these exceptions? Are these policies that are easy to find online or it's just word of mouth contacting embassies? You know, it seems like it may not be spelled out in many cases. Like does Uruguay really accept you based on this or that? Uh, yeah, maybe it's, it's it not spelled out. So if you wanna go somewhere and like people like us in this community, we've already made it our mission to go everywhere and find out how to go everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in which case, uh, let's say let's say in my case i would need to do a lot more research a lot more in advance than let's say my friend adam hmm. so uh, it's not well documented but it's it's a it's a good travel hack that most people who are let's say traveling on asian passports or african passports they know this hack if, if they're like uh, if they've been traveling for a while now yeah interesting and it's something that uh I, I only became more more aware of it entering this community and talking with other travelers as well of of the the different ways. I mean, just finding out in my case, U.S. passports very strong, but then 
you contact an embassy or look at the embassy's website and they want to get the visa fee so they don't even tell you they have an e-visa you know so it's uh, uh and I'm, I'm thinking the so airline a good, uh, a good resource to refer to is always uh thematic or timatic however you pronounce it uh, the google flow is just type timatic t-i-m-a-t-i-c passport visa that's all you have to type in google so i don't mean type passport as in the country's name and just just type the words timatic passport visa in google the first link you get you type into that you fill up and it'll tell you like so for example if i am going from dubai to mozambique and i'm going to transit in somalia do I need a transit visa in Somalia? This will answer, Timatic will answer all your questions based on point A to point B and any transit in between. And this is the system that, that all of the airlines use. So when an airline says you can board or not board the flight, this is what they're checking and, and it's... Yeah, uh, so the guy at the check-in desk is actually going to Timatic. They, every airline has their own like you know paid access version. Mm -hmm. That's what they're checking. That's what I check. I don't believe what embassies tell me because embassies are notoriously... Uh, Let's say they, uh, Angola is a great uh, Angola is a great example. That's the first time I ever met Devjit. Mm -hmm. So the Ang Angola had just announced that they've gone visa free. So we, Devjit, me, Jujana, and Adam decided we'll, and of course Preeti, my wife, decided we'll go to Angola. Mm -hmm. And uh, Adam must have gone to the Angolan consulate a couple of times. I must have. It's, it's down the road from my house. I've probably gone there four or five times. Jujana went to the one in Dubai and in the one in Abu Dhabi. I think none of us managed to get the right story from any of them. And uh, finally, uh, despite this website being available, none of us got through, we had to we had to go there and go to the embassy. They didn't know there's a website and there's a there's an online process. So okay. don't trust, don't trust embassy, don't trust uh, embassy website, just go to Timatic. Save yourself the pain and the nightmare. A few weeks ago, in an interview, we had uh, TCC club president Tim Skeet on, who um, also works works in the airlines his whole career, and he talked about how during the recent shifts, it was, I mean, thematic, instead of being updated daily or weekly, it was like minute by minute, but that that is the official thing. That's what all the countries are submitting to, and, and of course, governs air travel, and uh, so that that is that, that is the place to go for for all of that information. Um, the Angola visa story. Yeah, my, uh, you, you guys had your thing. Mine, mine was more just a social engineering where I was applying in New York and uh, applying for a transit visa at the time. And they finally called me a few days after I applied and they said, but you're coming from Johannesburg and going back. So why do you need to transit? And, <laughs> and the only thing I could think to say was, I hear you have a beautiful country. And <laughs> And then, like a week later, they called and said, "Okay, you have your visa." You know, which, uh, you know it was just it was totally a bogus transit. But uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it gets it gets lucky that way. Um, yeah. Yes, but so, anyway. so using transit, using transit is a very good travel hack. So uh, when we went to Angola the first time, we actually used Angola as a transit point to get to Sao Tome. And Principe. We didn't go to Principe. We did. We did spend some time in Sao Tome, but we spent three days there. We used our ticket on Angolan Airlines as the as the transit hop, and on our way back, we did the stay in Angola. So there, are, I've I've done this like when I had to get a Paraguayan visa. I didn't end up going there, but the nearest country was Lebanon. I hadn't been to Lebanon, so I decided to go to Lebanon, do something in Lebanon while my passport is getting that Paraguayan visa. So that's another way in which I've been, which I've used, uh, you know other embassies with where which don't have representation here in order to travel and see another country. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, fantastic. I love hearing about the resourcefulness of of putting this stuff together. I think when I went through Sao Tome, I, I think I applied for the transit visa and I there was supposed to be a fee and then they just gave me the visa entry and didn't even bother charging me money at the end. And and I was yeah, very happy, but yeah, it was just be creative if, if if you're theoretically eligible for the visa type. I guess let them let them determine that and, mm. and be honest and, and apply. And, and sometimes you get uh, you get a great surprise. So, is there one trip that you've taken that I that I haven't asked about uh, that that all of your fans are saying why haven't we heard this story uh, from your betrayal group? <laughs> any which story? Anyone? Yeah, tell I me. Is there any story I should have asked about? I feel like I hardly know you, and all these guys are. <laughs> Are, uh, pulling there, is, there, out, so. that, uh, there, there is one story that uh, 
Adam, Adam, me, and a couple of other friends, we'd, we'd gone to Burundi. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to see in Burundi, right, was the source of the Nile, right? Mm. Uh, I was captivated by it. It's like the Nile is the mightiest river on earth. The Nile passes oh. through all of Africa. Right? <laughs> okay. When I went to the Burundi embassy, like the Burundi embassy here in Dubai is like this rundown villa. It's like 20 years old, dilapidated, the, you know, the, the, it's a terrible embassy. But I went there. Uh, the guy asked me, so why do you want to go to Burundi? I want to see the source of the Nile. I blurted it. It was the first thing that I, with pride. I'm like, I know about your country. I've done my research. <laughs> Are you serious? Really? I said, yes, yes. I'm, I I want to go. Like, I, I will go to Bujumbura. Then I will go to Gitega. Then I will. Do, do, do. So, so yeah, he knew I did my research. He's like, sure. You're, you're going to enjoy this trip. Gives me the visa. Like, so, you know, so me and Adam and Harold and our other friend, Koli, we're all like, you know, we get out of that bus, we, we reach the source of Nile, we get out of the bus, we go down that staircase. Okay, <laughs> we're looking for it. <laughs> and we keep looking for it. There's a little tap, there's a little tap with a stream pouring out of it. And uh, Adam recorded it, but our, our guidebook, okay, I mean, sorry, not our guidebook, our guide, our guide, he told us his story about how the, the blue Nile joins the brown Nile and then it meanders through this. <laughs> forest and it joins the pink nile and then the pink nile and the orange nile join together in khartoum and then it becomes the real nile but this is actually the source of the it was it was quite an uh, an oration from this guy yeah yeah and our friend harold uh, he came with his drone he set up his he spent half, before we went down he didn't he want he didn't want to spoil his own surprise so he set up his drone he spent half an hour like you know and we're like come on guys we're itching to go we need to see this so like his drone is ready we go down and like we see that source of the Nile. So yeah, this goes down in one of my biggest uh, travel disappointments of all time. I'm sorry if it was a spoiler for a lot of you guys. Please go and see the source of the Nile in Burundi. I, I, I've i been there. I <laughs> This is much better. <laughs> Hearing you tell the story is much better than than seeing that, that spot. It's <laughs> I, I can't even keep going on. I think that's a perfect place to stop. I'm, I'm just going to keep laughing all afternoon. And it's it's past midnight for you, so. Yeah, it is, it is. It's way past my bedtime, but I'd like to end on um, a nice travel story. Okay. Uh, something yeah. that I discovered. Uh, so I've, uh, thanks to Devjit, I got this idea of uh, of doing self-drive. So Preeti, my wife and I, we, we started doing self-drive a lot. And uh, I mean, this is just me, right? This is something that I discovered I like, was like these weird, quirky, insane monuments. And there's no place in the world better to find weird, quirky, insane, crazy ass monuments than the ex Yugoslavian Balkan republics. So everywhere you go, I mean, if, if you, there's this thing called Spominic database, they call Spominics. Okay. They look like these very, very futuristic science fiction spaceship like monuments, or as if like some alien, imagine an alien, an alien civilization came to earth centuries ago and built some monuments. They, so they're all quirky, they're all very unique. And if you like monuments, okay, do a self-drive in any of the Yugoslavian countries that's like, like Serbia, mm. Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Am I missing, I'm missing out quite a few. Uh, Kosovo. Say, what is it, Geomatic that documents a lot of those? Do you look at that site? Uh, Spominic database, S-P-O-M-E-N-I-K. Okay. Spominic I've also database. Seen a blog called Yomatic that I documented a lot of those, but I'll have to check yeah. out this other site. Yeah. And it, it, it's a, it's a very it's a it's a beautiful experience because you're driving through some great countryside. You've got an objective in place, so you, you know you're you're taking in a lot of the country. You're, you're actually getting to do a deep dive, which you would not otherwise be doing because you mm -hmm. you have to hike to some of these monuments as well. Yeah. So all in all, th that was the highlight of of. Oh, I guess we will. Have to leave it there. His connection, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it was the household saying it's it, it's time for it, it is time to go to bed. So we will uh, thank thank uh, Ryan in absentia for for his wonderful uh, evening for us. I'll I'll give him just a few more seconds to see if he gets reconnected in, in, into our video. But uh, I I certainly enjoyed getting to know Ryan much better. I've I've worked with him in EPS in a bit of a way. Oh, he is back to, to officially sign out. That's perfect. There you are. Hey, hey. Sorry, I don't know what happened, but I guess it was my computer telling me it's bedtime. It is, so I was just thanking you for, for sharing a, 
all, all, all your, your, your wonderful and, and uh, often funny stories and, and for all you're doing for EPS. And I'll, I'll leave the final sign off to you, sir. Right. It was great. Uh, it was great uh, talking to you, Stefan. It was great uh, looking at all of these comments. There's just so much here that I wanted to address, but I just couldn't address. But whoever, I mean, I can recognize most of you by your comments. Thanks a lot mm -hmm. for uh, tuning in. It was great uh, talking to you guys. Uh, I'm always here if you have questions. So good night and see you soon. Bye, everybody.